I will be very happy to answer your questions. Uh, we have a short uh, session uh, for questions and answers now. Uh, if you have given your questions in writing, then somebody can read them. You have the questions. Okay, so can you bring those questions here? Okay, and now uh, mm, question and answer session. And uh, I will try to read it. Uh, uh, usually uh, Tarek do it, but he is not here. So I will try to adjust my accent, so probably you will understand my... If I can't understand the Russian accent, I'll read what the, he's written. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, the first question. Uh, I know that forgiving others is uh, essential. Uh, can you tell me how to let go of... Uh, 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 grudges and uh, speed up the progress of forgiveness? This is a question about forgiveness. Forgiveness is good for one good reason. If we understand the law of karma, the law of karma is action and reaction. Whatever you do, if you do something which your conscience says is good, you'll be rewarded. If you do something that the conscience says is not good, you'll be punished. That's the law of karma, very simple law of karma. Appears to be operating in the physical world very uh, all over. Appears to be working in the astral world and appears to be generated in the causal world. So the law of karma, I could talk at length about the law of karma, but to say that karma can create a reaction. You hurt somebody, that person will hurt you. If you then in retaliation hurt again, then that person comes back to hurt you again. It's a cycle that never ends because we do not cause a closure to that event. This is especially true of negative karma. If you have a negative karma, that means it's painful and you are hurt and you do not remember, do not know, you can only be hurt because you hurt somebody else earlier and that's why you're being hurt. So you think it's a new hurt and therefore you must hurt back, then the cycle will continue. Every time it will be like that. Especially if there's a gap of a whole lifetime between the two events. Then you can't even remember why this is happening. In the same lifetime, sometimes you can remember you did something wrong, you are getting something wrong back, and therefore you should not perpetuate it. But when the action is of a past life, and you are getting hurt or feeling pain now, and you want to react to that, it perpetuates that karma. If you forgive, the karma ends. Forgiveness is a great way to end the cycle of karma. That means whenever you feel hurt, if you can forgive that person, you are ending that karma right there. So forgiveness has been recommended as a very strong way, very useful and effective way of stopping the cycle of karma going moving forward. So that is why forgiveness is important. But then, it's so difficult to forgive. We find we have grudges against people. We can't get rid of them. How can we possibly forgive people? There was a book containing thoughts of the day. In that, I opened it randomly at one page. It says forgiveness. And it says, there are some things in life that are unforgivable. That's exactly when you should forgive. Forgiving things that are easy to forgive is not a great thing. But there's something that we carry grudges and we say it's unforgivable. Apply this rule. If you recall that you are ending a karma with this, that you did something for this happening, you can forgive. Bringing this awareness into your head that I am closing a karma, not perpetuating it, helps in forgiveness. So I would strongly recommend that wherever possible, whenever you feel you are hurt or you're carrying a grudge, forgive and end it there. Forgiveness has several other values, but one value which is imminent and immediately available is closure to the karma. Uh, next question. Uh, why do enlightened people strive to enlighten others? Good question. Why do enlightened people strive to enlighten others because they are not enlightened? <laughs> if a person is striving to enlighten somebody, he's not enlightened at least not sufficiently enlightened. It depends what you mean by enlightenment. If by enlightenment means that you have read a lot, know many words, 
and you know the scriptures by heart and you're telling people that you are enlightened. That is not enlightenment. You have to work very hard to convince people. There are people going out all the way trying to convince people. But true enlightenment, which is a discovery of your own self, how will you try to strive to do something when you know that the whole of projection is yourself? How will you strive to enlighten somebody when you know that's the, your shadow? How are you going to enlighten your shadow? Have you ever tried to enlighten your shadow? <laughs> Have you ever st stood in front of a mirror and said, I'm going to enlighten this guy I'm seeing in the mirror? When you are enlightened, you see that the whole of structure of reflections is yourself. You don't try to enlighten anybody. You don't strive to enlighten. Perfect living masters have never striven to enlighten anybody. They have allowed coincidences to happen by which the seekers at the right time come to them and they take responsibility for them. It's a very different way. So be sure that is not true enlightenment if somebody is striving to enlighten you. How can uh, we identify what is intuition as opposed to impulse of thought, And also intuition to guide our lives and use intuition to guide our lives. Should we try and cultivate intuition uh, on a daily basis? Or should we just meditate more and wait for intuition to de develop naturally? This is, this is very interesting. This is a question about intuition. How do we develop intuition? The answer to that question, how do you develop intuition is you can't. It's a natural gift of the soul, of consciousness, to be intuitive. You can develop logic. You can develop reasoning. You can develop the power of the mind to argue. You can develop those things which are belonging to the mind. But you cannot develop love and intuition. It's part of our is the nature of our soul, the nature of our consciousness. And therefore, you can't develop it. Somebody says to me, I, am, I have found out a way of developing intuition. I said, how was that? He said, I said, can you give me an example? He said, all right. I am going to intuitively find out if I'll go for lunch today or not. I said, okay, let's see how you'll find out. He said, uh, I'll go to lunch. Did you see? I said, I noticed, ah, before you said that. Did you know that when you use time, it cannot be intuition? When you use that, ah, uh, and then bring that, it's your mind working to get that answer. It's a reasoned thought and not intuition at all. Intuition is spontaneous, does not involve time and space, whereas all reasoning takes time and space. Therefore, we confuse rapid thinking, rapid reasoning as equivalent to intuition. It is not. Intuition is a gut feeling that you get very often opposed to what you are thinking and reasoning. The reasoning says, this is not right for me. Intuition says, go ahead. The gut feeling says, go ahead. That sudden feeling with no time is intuition and not the one that we try to develop. We can't try and do these things. A one friend of mine from Harvard, from Boston, wrote a letter to me. He said, I have discovered that it is not effort that will pay anything. Even meditation has to be effortless. And effortless means that everything should be no effort. At the end he says, I am now trying very hard to be effortless. <laughs> That's how our mind works. We can't help it. So real intuition cannot be developed and has to grow with us. And it is right that meditation, being on the spiritual path, Experience of love and devotion and responding to love and devotion builds intuition automatically, just like it builds coincidences automatically. Some people may have noticed that as intuitive gut feeling develops in you, coincidences outside also develop at the same time. That means there is a correlation between what is happening inside and what is happening outside. People who have come on the spiritual path after some years, say, you know, the number of coincidences in our life has increased a lot. So have the number of intuitive gut feelings that they've got. So there's a connection between what is happening outside and inside. Because in the words of a great master, they are the same thing. So when we get the inkling from outside, what we call a coincidence. What is a coincidence? Just a synchronicity of events which is improbable. 
law of probability would not have caused that event to happen and it happens. That is a coincidence. So, when a coincidence happens and the feeling inside is like that, you have a thought which is beyond your reason. Something has come into your head. I can't believe it how it came into my head. You drive your car and there is a sign selling some perfume or something. And, but the first word is exactly the thought that you had in the morning. What is that kind of coincidence? It is a confirmation of the intuitive <coughs> information that you got. So, intuition functions automatically. It is not developed. You can't try and get it. But with meditation, it will develop by itself. Yes? Um, the next question. Um, with, uh, without, without reincarnation, back home is back to my uh, conception. Meditation is uh, intentional regression into childhood. All of these planes are places I was at since I was uh, conceived. Looks like it's a question or confirmation. I'm not sure. It's an answer. Answer, yeah. <laughs> we, we didn't say they can only write questions. You can write questions or answers or comments. Okay, this is is marked as an answer, not a question. See? Question, it's an answer. Somebody has delivered this answer to me. And at the top it says Q and A. So he's circled A. That means it's an answer. Without reincarnation, back home is back to my conception. Meditation is intentional regression into childhood. All of these planes are places I was at since I was conceived. I would agree with this statement with one little modification. that The conception we are talking of here is not conception of a human body in the mother's womb. It's conception in such kind, the true beginning of our consciousness. When we take that as our real birth in our true home, and from there we descended to all levels of experiences, and these experiences are our total life. Our total life is not a human life. It's a very, very small segment of total experience. Our total experience is infinite. In this infinite experience, at various levels of consciousness, we have come into a state right now from where we can retrace it back and go back all the way back to that point of conception, not physical conception in the physical body. That's a very binary event that happened. Our soul, immortal soul, has not come here only to have a little experience. It has come from stage to stage. It is true that the entire path of spirituality which we are talking about takes you to the same stages through which you came. It is true that if we call our being in our true home as our point of conception, then the answer you have given is correct and I appreciate it. Thank you very much.